Hello, this is Mark Herman again, um, designer of Empire of the Sun. I have to say that I was uh, very heartened by the initial uh, response to the very long strategy video that I did, and so for grins and chuckles, I'm going to continue doing them for a bit. And today, actually, actually at this moment, I started shooting this yesterday on December 7th, um, 2013, which was obviously the anniversary of Pearl Harbor, so I thought that for this strategy video, I would actually start with the historical beginning of the uh, of the war. And so what you see in the shot here, uh, right below the um, Empire of the Sun logo that's on the uh, map, and by the way, this is the production um, map this time, so you're looking at actually what you would get in a box of, uh, of Empire of the Sun. And that large pile of pieces, uh, which has a 25-3 uh, showing on it, that's uh, Oahu, Pearl Harbor, and you can see to the uh, left in the shop uh, a number of yellow counters, and that is the carrier, the Japanese carrier force called Kido Bute. I'm sure I'm uh, really hurting that uh, particular uh, pronunciation, but uh, there it is, and that is the location that the Japanese carriers were on when they launched the actual attack on December 7th, 1941. Now, what you also will notice is that uh, in the foreground there are two um, pieces. Uh, they are uh, carriers. Uh, it's uh, specifically the uh, Enterprise which is just returning from Wake Island where they had just uh, sent a squadron of uh, marine air units that actually were uh, instrumental in the uh, Wake uh, defenders actually giving uh, holding off the Japanese for much longer than the Japanese intended. It was one of the major early victories for, for the U.S., but of course the inability to relieve them led to its subsequent uh, fall. And in it, early, and so the Enterprise you'll see is two spaces or two hexes away from Oahu, so they're almost back into uh, the port. In fact, later in the day, planes from the uh, Enterprise did in fact uh, come into the uh, harbor and were shot at because, you know, the, the place was a little bit jumpy after having been bombed uh, uh, just earlier that day. And then further in you see the Lexington which was actually on its way to Midway to deposit um, or to fly off air, air units to that location uh, but that's where it was approximately at this point in time further out to sea and out of the action. So you know one of the Japanese concerns was that the US carriers would in fact uh, locate them and attack them Obviously, they were at, the U.S. carriers were outnumbered three to one, and in fact, if the U.S. had actually found the Japanese carriers, it may have gone even worse for us. But as it is, you know, that's kind of where things were. Now, the way the Empire of the Sun is played, again, this is not an instructional video, but certainly uh, the, the first turn of the game is the December 41. Most games, other than the first turn, all turns in the game represent uh, four months of time. So each, you know, you have an early, mid, and late turn for each of the years of the war. But the December 41 turn uh, was actually intended to be a instructional video, uh, not a video, an instructional uh, piece where you could play solitaire and kind of walk yourself through the procedures in the game. And so if you, in fact, have a copy of the game and you go to page 40 of the rule book, 19.0, Comprehensive Example of Play, everything that I'm about to do or show or say for this rest of this video is included in... Uh, that piece with all the you know the numerical details. So I'm not going to repeat what's in the rule book, but at least I can walk you through sort of the thinking on what the Japanese are doing when they launch this initial attack. So the first card that has to be played in the game if you're playing the long the, the full campaign. Most people, by the way, for tournament play, we play the 42 campaign start, which would be uh, January of 42. So these two cards you're about to see, in fact. Uh, I will put them in the shot now. So this is the Operation Z card, which is the attack on Pearl Harbor, which we're about to go over. And then the other card that you would play in 1941 is uh, the uh, Operation Number 1, Conquest of Southeast Asia card. So those are the two cards. And again, it's meant for solitaire play because the Allied player effectively doesn't do anything other than maybe roll dice once in a while. But uh, ultimately, that's uh, what's going to happen. And, of course, you know, like any uh, surprise attack based on an intelligence failure, there's a a whole host of uh, special rules that apply to just this situation. But the beautiful thing about uh, cards is that those rules are not, these rules are not in the rule book, they're right here in front of you on the card. 
And so you'll see that you know the Operations E card is very specific about which units are going to move. They get to move a little bit further than usual because the Japanese historically gave a, a bit of uh, you know special. You know they only had so many tankers, and they basically the oil tankers to keep the fleet at sea and get them in the extended range because this is well beyond the logistics range of what the Japanese fleet was capable of except in extraordinary uh, planning circumstances. So again, the logistics of getting this carrier group uh, to Oahu. Uh, then it has a whole, basically, you have to attack 5808, which is Oahu, which is Pearl Harbor. Uh, and then of course, to account for the fact that, you know, Oahu is, you know, half asleep on a peacetime footing that the ships are moored, they're not moving, and all those kind of things. You know, their defense factors are heavy, they, they don't get to shoot back. And then when it's all over, the U.S. carriers are just, you know, put in, you know, the Japanese are now leaving, the carriers show, go, are put into the port, and the game begins. And so what we're going to do now is we're just going to roll some dice here, and we'll kind of resolve the actual attack to begin this video. Okay, so what you see now... Uh, I've sort of separated out the counters from the stack so you could see what's going on. So effectively, Oahu, you'll see there's a piece called, a, it says a 15-10. At the top it says MD slash CA. Think of that as Battleship Road. Uh, next to it, you have, it says the New Orleans, but that sort of represents the other warships. Um, it, that piece contains a lot of units that were destroyers and, and other units that were in the harbor that day. And then you have the Seventh Air Force, which is broken into two pieces, right? The, there's a 10-10-2, which stands for its attack strength of 10, defense strength of 10, and its range of 2. You can barely see there's a white number above it, which is a 4, so it has an extended range for the medium uh, air bombers. And then there's a piece that's uh, basically unique to the um, Allies, which is a long-range bomber, which is a 4-10-6, which is basically the B-17s that were uh, at that location. And then above it, you'll see to the far left of the yellow pieces a 17-14. Uh, That's the um, battle cruisers, uh, 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 the uh, Congo class that accompanied the um, Japanese carriers. Uh, you also have in there, uh, there's a class of Japanese search uh, cruisers that are included in that because there's a Congo two pieces which is weaker, but that's where those two uh, special Japanese cruisers are located. Again, every ship that fort in the Pacific is included in some piece, and, there, and so that's what the differences in the numbers are. And then you have the uh, six Japanese carriers, uh, two of the Akagi class, two of the Soryu class, and two of the Shikaku and the Zuikaku class. Again, I apologize uh, to my Japanese listeners for the pronunciations. And because the, the Japanese are attacking at range, the, uh, Japanese, the uh, Japanese battleship is going to have no um, numerical effect on the battle. It could help them on defense if they were attacked, but from, a, from an offensive point of view, it's not in the battle heck. So it's off, you know, again, escorting the Japanese carriers. So the Japanese, if you add up those three numbers, it's 36 attack factors. And what's going to happen is, is that the, the, it's a surprise attack, and so the, uh, the Japanese are going to roll their die first. We're adding three to this die roll. Uh, off, it didn't quite make it into the shot, but you heard it hit, and it came up as a five. I think I, you can see that. Uh, let's just you know, shift it over there. So in the uh, in the combat system, it's a five. You're adding three to it, so the Japanese will achieve 36 hits uh, because it's a one x result. Uh, the system basically, if you think about. Uh, what we used to call, or still call, a bag of dice system. Basically, you roll, you know, every unit, every unit factor rolls a die, and if you roll like a six or a five or a four, five or six, or whatever, that generates a hit. And you just take a big bag of dice and you throw them on the table for a lot of factors, and you add them all up. This system is basically doing the same thing with only one die roll. Basically, you're taking the number of factors, and you're basically building a distribution of you know, how many would be hits, etc. So the, the results in all cases are either going to be a quarter, half, or full result. And in this situation, normally a 6 through 9 is a full result, and because it's a surprise attack, you get to add 3 to the die roll, so we end up with the historical full attack as it happened. And then comes the way in which the combat system works, is you now apply hits. Now normally, 36 hits would effectively flip the battleship, see the 10 defense strength, so 10 hits would flip that over, 
10 hits would flip over one of the airplanes, 10 hits would flip over the other plane, and you'd have six hits, and it would be too few to apply to the six hits is not enough to flip the cruiser, and that would be sort of the end of the combat normally. We have halved all of the defense strengths just for this first strike. Again, that's on the card that I showed you just a moment ago. So, if you now figure, think of it, uh, since it's half, that face value is the total number of hits to kill the piece. Okay, so we now know that we rolled a one-time result. We're going to apply 36 hits. And so the way the combat system goes is, if I flip over all three units, so the jet, the, both the air units are five each, flipping over the battleship piece, again, normally its defense strength would be higher, but they're moored. So again, I account for the fact that it's not going to survive this attack. Uh, is a 5, that's 15, and 4 more for the uh, New Orleans is 19. So let's first do, apply those 19 hits by flipping all the pieces over. And the basic rule in the game is you cannot apply any hits to a reduced unit until all the full strength units are flipped. Again, there's a rare, there's an exception if you roll a straight up 9, you get a critical hit, and then you can apply the hits without that restriction, but, but you still only get one times hit. So 36 hits, now we've got 19 applied. Okay, so obviously 36, we've applied 19 hits. Uh, we now have 17 more hits to go. Uh, this is now a matter of taste. Uh, you could, uh, but let's just go historical. So first off, we're going to take, you know, so f for 17 more hits, we can either knock out the two um, air units and the battleship, or we can knock out an air unit, the battleship, and the cruiser. Uh, for my taste, because the air units come back, I would probably go a little bit ahistorical here and decide to apply more hits to the naval units. And so what I would suggest is we take out 5, 14 hits, leaving only the B-17 in the, in the hex. And again, we have, um, we applied 15 of the 7, we have 2 hits left over, but because it takes 5, in this case usually it would be 10, but 5 hits to kill this piece, we have insufficient hits, we're done. Okay, this would now uh, work out, let me restack the pieces is the, the Japanese are still sitting in this hex, so we've now completed the, the operation. And this air unit, and the, and the card tells you that the US carriers are now in this location. They've sailed in at the evening, uh, you know, and caught up to the situation. And at this point, the, uh, the Japanese do what we call post-battle movement. Um, and so, uh, they now, uh, we now move those back uh, 18 hexes, because again, it was a, they, they, they go back as far as they came out. So they came out 18 hexes, they go back 18. Usually, the maximum movement of a naval unit would be 15 hexes. But again, this is based on the extraordinary logistic support they gave to this operation. And now these ships would go back. So the biggest choice you have in the beginning is where am I going to send the Japanese carriers? And you have a couple of choices. Historically, they went back to Japan. And so that would be sending the pieces basically all the way back across the Pacific, back to here. My purpose is I like to send the Japanese carriers to the Marshall Islands uh, anyway, because it gives you options about what you might do relative to the Pearl Harbor. But again, the historical was they, went, they ultimately all ended back in Japan with the uh, small uh, sojourn of the, uh, the Soryu and Hiryu and their escorts. And so one thing I didn't talk about in the other video uh, one of the effects of the Operation Z card, again, this is all written down on the card, is at the beginning of the war, the U.S. political will starts at zero. In other words, we're at peace. And after Pearl Harbor, the, the first thing, the last part of the card is the U.S. political will goes to eight. So that's the sort of the effect of the a, a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. And one of the big mechanics in the game that the U.S. has to be conscious of is that Japanese taking locations will move this political will marker down, and if you can ever get it into the zero thing, uh, zero box, you get a negotiated settlement to the war. Now, that negotiated settlement doesn't mean that the Japanese won, the U.S. surrendered. It just means that perhaps Japan surrenders but uh, isn't occupied, which is what they were going for. Or Japan surrenders and they get to keep Manchuria and they don't get occupied. But whatever it is... It's the idea that the U.S. has moved off of, uh, you know, unconditional surrender. And unless that happens, the game's going to go to the bitter end. Uh, but so at the end of the Pearl Harbor, the U.S. political will is eight, and that is a resource that will be chipped away at by the Japanese uh, moves and conquests going forward.